Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. We're a small but powerful panel, and we have a panel of powerful women representing this industry sector that we'll get into in great detail in a moment. Um, I just want to thank the opportunity that Barbara and our partners, and our, especially our industry and labor partners and our education partners, have provided to do this research. Department of Energy, the $5 million grant, uh, has been instrumental in taking us in new directions to create some new research that we think adds real value to the work that we collectively need to do as we move forward in this new smart grid environment. So it's just a great opportunity and we're very happy to have WSU's involvement in this ongoing project. Uh, the relationships that this partnership have, uh, has fostered with our uh, various partners, really the, the benefits of that are measurable. Uh, we had an internal evaluation on this DOE project and looking at the consortium and yesterday our advisory group some of the results of that. Uh, it's really astounding the amount of uh, relationship building and trust that's happened. And uh, for us to make progress in this grant program has really been based on those interpersonal relationships, the ability of, that we have to share information and trust each other that this, this uh, great uh, research and uh, the new programs that we're trying to develop uh, are going to be based on really good real-time information that's going to make a difference for our, our companies, uh, our students, and our institutions trying to move this all forward. So it's all good stuff. Um, Brian Davis and I, just on a funny note, uh, we're trying to think about how we could make this session more interactive. Uh, to talk about partnership, uh, my colleague Sally Zager Hansen, who's not in the audience at the moment, but she will be. Uh, so Ryan and I had this all worked out. We're going to have microphones and great AV visuals. And, and we had this idea we're going to have everybody come and sit on stools because you'd be kind of up above the audience. And, and Ryan and I just thought, oh, we got this all figured out. Cool. And Sally looks at me and says, yeah, but it's going to be four women. And I said, so? She said, well, some of them might want to wear skirts. <laughs> Ryan and I both just went right over our heads. So that's the power of partnership and blind spots that your partners can help you cover on. And if there's trust, you're, you're going to understand what that's all about. But I will say, uh, nobody wore skirts today. So, They're afraid of the stools. So it would have worked that. It would have worked anyway. Um, so I just want to say that this panel. not on stools. That's right. And we're still glad you're not on stools. We don't want to have any accidents here. Yeah. So this panel, um, I think you're going to find this to be a very interesting conversation. And we'll get into the details in a few minutes. But we thought it would be very useful to try to pro provide some context uh, for where we ended up with this uh, customer service uh, representative skills standards project. As you know, uh, WSU has been part of this larger grant program. And one of our first projects out of the gate was to really to develop a career lattice. Lattice being a way to show the relationships between key occupations uh, in the industry, industry, energy industry that we found to be very important. It came up time and time again when we had conversations with our industry and labor partners as really being key occupations as we move forward into this smart grid arena. And that allowed us to, to select uh, some of these occupations to take a closer look at some of the areas, the skill requirements, and some of the gaps that we know were emerging. Um, this is really an opportunity because we have many educators here today to do a good job of listening. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, this is our opportunity to hear from the perspective of our industry partners what's changing, what's happening, what really is going to be uh, on the forefront <coughs> in this industry, and where do we need to be prepared, both as students and educational institutions and as employers, uh, as we move into this uh, era where we have increasingly rapid rate of technology <coughs> adoption, more innovation, and different expectations, not only from employers, but also essentially from our customers. As you heard earlier, it's customers that are driving all of this. Nowhere is that more evident than in the customer service ranks, where there's a direct interaction with customers and clients uh, about their expectations and about the new opportunities for customers to have more control over their own energy futures, which is part of what Smart Grid is all about. Wanda Reeder mentioned it earlier, this poses some particular challenges to this industry, which has a certain culture. But I think all of you will agree that our educational institutions have a similar culture. And in fact, when we were talking with uh, Pete Safin, who is our evaluator, one of the great quotes he came up with was something to the effect uh, that both utilities and institution, uh, educational institutions are equally risk averse. So we have some real issues to deal with as institutions, both as a utility industry and as educators, to break out of that box. 
And what's interesting about Smart Grid is the technology is leading some of that change, leading some of those expectations, really forcing us to think in different ways about the relationships with our, our customers, with technology, and especially what is going to be required of our future workforce. So great opportunity to hear from our panel of experts today about that. So just moving this forward, um, in the DOE grant, as we built our proposal, one of the things that we wanted to look at, especially, was looking at the demand side, customer service reps, meter techs. People are going to have a more direct interaction with customers out in the field. At the same time, we knew that the same uh, kinds of changes that embody smart grid technologies are going to have an impact on supply side. People who are installing systems, who are attending the lines and infrastructure, line workers, relay specialists, ground crew. We wanted to have a look at kind of the full spectrum of supply and demand occupations as we move forward. And we, I try to identify these occupations based upon research, but also direct conversations with our employer partners. Which are the ones we really ought to pay attention to? Either because we know about retirement shifts, population dynamics, or because there's some immediate shortages in some of these key occupations. Where are our companies paying attention right now? What are they worried about in terms of future development and filling these job gaps? So in addition to using this information as a way to collect data on these kinds of opportunities and descriptions of jobs and what are the educational programs that are required and using that to help develop the PNCCE website where a lot of this information is housed, it was a great opportunity to have more in-depth conversations with our employer partners about smart grid and what they're thinking about in terms of occupational requirements and skill sets. One of the things that we discovered as we uh, inquired about these occupations and what kinds of issues have come up is that we found some things about these occupations that were very important. One is, in many utility organizations, these jobs are fairly distinct. This was more pronounced, perhaps, on the supply side, where a lineman does, job, does work that's very distinct from somebody who works in a substation, which is very distinct from some other occupations. Where there tended to be more overlap were in the demand side jobs, with a little more slippage between an energy advisor and an RCM, or somebody who's doing an energy conservation program. Even for uh, CSRs, there's more overlap for some occupations. But perhaps the most interesting uh, finding, uh, in addition to the fact that these jobs are different between each utility, there's no standardization per se, was the fact that every employer we talked to said that the implementation of smart grid is going to require more from all employees, especially the man side, in the areas of information technology, data management and analysis, and how we communicate, not just what we communicate. So this led to some very interesting findings that we explored a little bit deeper. And as we think about how we go about defining smart grid for ourselves, which really is about this overlay of communications, IT, and data analysis, and data itself, you see that it begins to transcend both supply side and demand side occupations. It's going to impact all of them, but each of them in a slightly different way. So we began to break down these jobs in both supply and demand side. And this is just one example of the kind of spaghetti chart that we came up early on in our, uh, on our research that attempted to track where people start, where they might go, what are some related skill sets, kind of where is the experience uh, ladder, if you will, and how do these jobs interrelate. And what we found was that there are indeed some patterns of relationships and many connections uh, and many pathways, uh, especially among some of these, these different demand side occupations. And as we look, begin to look even closer about how people get into the utility of the energy industry, we begin to see the important pivotal role that CSR occupations play as a portal for uh, career development, for entry, and for employment into our utility system. This is really an area where we have a lot of people coming in for the first time to have that experience. And that really this is kind of the feedstock, if you will, for, uh, for the utilities, for the demand side occupations, um, and a place where they begin to derive a, a lot of their workers. So as we begin to think more seriously about where should we focus kind of our limited resources in year two, where should we begin to do some targeted research, we decided that CSRs had to really be part of the mix. Again, a portal, it's a large functional area, and this is where you have a large number of employees doing a lot of work every day. Lots of connections and options, uh, and importantly here for our discussion, this is the smart grid interface. This is where customers who are hearing about these new technologies and having access to new information through AMI 
are getting, beginning to ask questions, wanting information. They want to have a different relationship with their utility than they have before. And they have kind of customer service needs. They want to know how to use the information, how to make sure it's at their fingertips. What does certain information mean? Um, how can they use that to kind of chart their own energy use and destiny as they move down the, the, the tracks? The other thing that we really recognized, and Barbara said it, there were no standards available for this, uh, for this occupation. We, we looked across uh, many different projects, and we've developed a number of skill standards for most supply side occupations, but very few for demand side. So this was an opportunity to develop something that has shown to be very valuable for the energy industry to develop in programs uh, for colleges to think about improving the programs that they have and starting programs. But also, this is an opportunity to develop a bit of a uh, set of standards that were relevant to other industries. Think of an industry that doesn't have a call center operation or a customer service operation. <coughs> lots of commonalities, lots of expectation about customer service that we thought would be transferable to different industry sectors, thus adding value to selecting customer service reps as one of the focal points for this project. So we decided that the first step would need to be to develop and define what is it that customer service reps do all day, how well must they know how to do it, and what does that imply for the, life, the types of examples of, uh, what's the evidence of somebody who can do this job well? What are the standards for this industry? And if you want to look at a short description of what skill standards are, kind of our, our rubric, if you will, for how we approach this work, it's really looking at the skills, knowledge, and abilities of people who do this job and do it well. And how do you know when they do it well? What's the evidence that somebody is doing this job well? Most importantly, we wanted to be sure that this information was defined by people who do the work, frontline workers, not managers, not CEOs who think they know, people who are in the job, doing it all day long, dealing with customers, good, bad, and ugly, trying to make sense of this world as new technologies are implemented. And that uh, it proved to be a very challenging conversation in our focus group, which you'll, you'll hear about a little bit today. But more importantly, in the long term, we want to use these standards as a tool for educational institutions and for these companies themselves to do a better job of training their own workforces for the future of this industry, which will become more technologically advanced and dependent. Uh, new relationships, new expectations, how can we help to accomplish that with these standards? So how do we develop the standards? The first thing we do is we get good advice from people in the field who know a lot about these specific occupations and who are thinking ahead about these technologies as they receive them. That's this group here. These are all folks who are part of the advisory committee, uh, the organizations and individuals here today. These are the individuals that help us shape the project, that have good knowledge about skill standards, but also have good expertise in the fields uh, that, they're being rep that they're representing today. We again wanted to focus on using frontline employees to get the next level, the fine grain detail on what it is, what are the, is the skills that's required at what level, how, how do we know when we've achieved the high level of proficiency and competency in those areas. And we wanted to verify that what the focus group came up with is true to the industry at large. And I'll talk about in a moment, but we're in the process now of verifying the standards, uh, part of which you see on your chairs. So it's a very complicated process. And the, the handout that you've got on your chairs kind of sums up the critical work functions and the key activities that we identified with support directly from these frontline workers about what's important, what are the attributes, and what are some of the competencies that we know these are leading to, both in terms of the functions, but also the activities, including the performance indicators, the technical knowledge, skills, and abilities, and also those intangible requirements and competencies that we know are all important according to our employers. Things like teamwork, problem solving, basic computer use, showing up for work on time, but also critical thinking and communications. So this really formed the basis for this project. And what we're trying to do in addition to this is overlay some uh, additional information that we're deriving from focused interviews in the utility industry, but also outside of the industry, talking with individuals and experts that are developing new technologies that are still on their way that will once again change uh, the standard for the industry. What are they saying about future changes and what impact that may have on employees? What do we know about that? Next year, we're going to take an even more focused look and try to look at smart grid demonstration projects that are well advanced 
and to ask the question about this idea of big data, about IT, data analysis, data management, and communications. What does that really look like in some of these occupations? And you're going to hear about some of that today through our focus group discussion. So we're uh, very happy to have an opportunity to talk with our panel um, um, as we build these standards all along the way. So we build the standards, we feed them back. Do we have it right? Now, if we do have it right from the perspective of our participants, we've got to go out and verify this. Uh, we're now in the field with the draft document that you've seen, which uh, number in about 40 pages. Um, and we're expecting to have probably several hundred surveys back that will help us fine tune the document before it's ready to go to press. This will be the document that will go out to our employer partners, our labor partners, as well as to our educational institutions to help them do a better job of serving the needs for this industry. So we're going to complete that research. We're also going to try to design a template that can be used by our industry partners to drive these standards into their own training organizations. Uh, this is something we've never tried before, but there's a lot of interest in how our industry partners can also use these standards to their own benefit. So that's, in a very tight nutshell, um, what we're trying to accomplish with this project. But I thought it was an important backdrop for you to have as we have this conversation with our panelists. And I'm just so pleased uh, that we have such a diverse group here today. And uh, we had a phone conversation, I guess about a week ago, about this panel just to get geared up. And I was inclined to just back off and listen because there was so much conversation going on over a phone line. Uh, having to con try to control this here live, I think is going to be a real challenge. But I have every... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be careful here. That's right. And this is good because we have a smaller group, more intimate setting, and what we really wanted to accomplish was to have a conversation between our panelists and with our audience. So imagine you're sitting in a, uh, in a living room and the fire is crackling and you're having good yeasty conversation over a glass or two of wine. There we go. That's part of the And if we, can, if we can adopt that, we're going to have a great conversation today. So we have uh, learned quite a deal from our, our conversation and our interactions with our advisory group members and the focus group participants. And I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists today. Uh, first, on my right, uh, Delphine Armstrong, who's a utility service rep with uh, Tacoma Public Utilities. Uh, Delphine has, uh, we'll talk a little bit about her background, but I know she's uh, seen the CSR side and she's also seen the technical support smart grid side of, of this business and has a lot to share. Uh, Rachel Gebauer, who's here, uh, who's a business rep for IBW, uh, IBW Local 77. Uh, the IBW has been a key partner in this partnership uh, all along, every step of the way. Uh, and I think you'll hear a very interesting perspective on this industry and uh, the IBW's uh, role in this and where this industry is going vis-a-vis -vis organized labor. Andrea Jackson, who's a, a CIS project manager for Puget Sound Energy. Uh, has a very interesting perspective on this industry coming from outside of utilities and then being dropped into, really, the utility setting in uh, CSR operations. Uh, we, I remember that one of the first interviews we had was with uh, Andrea, and we were both amazed, Sally and I, at how she quickly grasped what's going on in this organization and had a very uh, unique perspective that she will share with us today. And finally, Diane Quincy from Avista, uh, who's the Director of Organizational Development and Training. Diane has been a, uh, a founding partner, if you will, in this DOE project, and because of Avista's deep investment in many of the smart grid demonstration projects that are going on in our region, uh, we thought she would also add a lot of perspective to this. Avista's been a key player in all of our grant activities from the very beginning. And indeed, all of our employers and the, uh, uh, that have been connected to this project throughout have played key roles. So what I've asked each of our panelists to do in just a short few sound bites. Number one is to give a quick introduction of themselves and then to respond to some of the information that I've just presented, uh, picking whatever they think is interesting, useful, uh, provocative, if you will. They may even disagree with it. Um, and to say a little bit about their perspective on the data that's been shown here in this project to date. And then what we'd like to do is to launch into a more free-form conversation around a series of questions and what you'll hear about today will be around issues related to what smart grid changes look like on the ground in our utilities from a CSR perspective. What are they hearing from customers? What kinds of issues are coming up? 
What are the biggest challenges as this is moving forward in our utilities? What are, how are these jobs evolving? How are they changing from what they were before? What kinds of pressures, expectations, things are happening on the ground for CSRs? How should students and employers and uh, our educational institutions be prepared for this? What, from your perspective, is making the difference? And what do our panelists see as the highest priorities and recommendations as we move forward? So I'd like to start uh, with Delphine and ask Delphine in just a minute to say what it is you do in your organization, kind of where your organization is in the smart grid world. And then a couple minutes, just you know, opening remarks, uh, commentary on some of the research that you've heard about already. Again, my name is Delphine Armstrong, and thank you for having me. I'm with Tacoma Power, and I started in Tacoma Power as a CSR, and now I work with a group of engineers. I am the only body that's not an engineer working with that group, and we, our, our title now for our group is Smart Grid. But prior to Smart Grid, we had a group that worked with smart meters. And so I maintain and manage the 18,000 accounts that we have that have smart meters. We do remote disconnect, reconnect, and we also have a group that does what we call pay as you go, a prepay program. So by having the smart meters, it has allowed us to implement those new programs or new departments. And also, um, I take calls for directly from the customers. So I do the troubleshooting with the smart meter accounts and the billing issues, and I also talk to customers about their consumption. In my opinion of the research that has been done and also of some of the speaking that I've heard today is we've hit the nail on the head. I don't think I could add anything to what has been said or to the research that Alan and other people have contributed to. I think we're on the right track and CSRs will be required to know more IT and data analysis and very involved with the customer. Thanks, Tom. Andrea? Okay. Um, I'm Andrea Jackson, so I am the uh, manager of the customer um, contact center at Puget Sound Energy. Um, we have about 250 reps, about 50 of those work from home. Um, in our call center and so we also are implementing a new system in our call center or in, at PSE, um, at SAP will be installed and I'm the project manager on that currently as well. So we are changing technology very, very rapidly um, in the industry. So I've been in the industry about three years, just about three and a half years and it struck me as coming into the industry, I've been in the call center industry for a long time. I started <laughs> when I was 12. And so, uh, but one of the things that struck me was in the utility industry, the CSR, the customer service rep, um, has to know so much information. They know much, much more than we do in the airline industry, uh, car rental industry, credit card industry, banking industry. So I've been in all of those call centers. And I was struck at how much more information and data the utility CSR had to know. What was interesting to me that, that there was no requirements for them to know that. They just kind of got this knowledge by osmosis over a number of years. Technology is forcing that gap to close. You cannot sit in that chair in a utility for eight years and just kind of learn it as you go. Customers are requiring the utility to know that information and our, our utility the utility knowledge base is, what's important about that is not that we know about power, it's how we share what we know about the power. And so I think that the, if the research that Allen's group is doing is quite timely because as more, as more and more technology um, comes into the utility industry at the pace at which it's changing, it will be very important that we equip our workers and our employees to be able to meet that demand because consumers are going to want to know what we know about that power. And that will be the, the game changer, I think, in the next in the next few years, uh, in very short order. Very short order. Thanks, Andrea. Rachel. My name is Rachel Kabauer. I am, like it says up there, a business representative for IBW Local 77. And I uh, started out with Puget Sound Energy as a customer service representative in 2005, and went to the customer construction portion of PSE. <coughs> Um, there I took calls 
talking to builders that needed new service for power and gas. And from there, I got more involved with my union, which is IBW Local 77. And on uh, the lot, the business manager said, we want you on staff as your knowledge as a CSR. So here I am. <laughs> um, so I have been out of the CSR ranks. I haven't taken calls for probably three or four years now. But I also represent the members at Puget Sound Energy. And so I'm hearing of all of these changes and being interested in all of these changes. And as as the representative for the members, we have to be open-minded as a union um, to what it, the technology is and coming down the pipes for being open-minded and how the members need to be represented, represented how um, negotiations are going to be coming in the future and all of that information. So um, to be on this advisory panel is very informative, especially hearing the smart grid information that Delphine is specifically working with. So, Thanks. Thank you. Diane, from an organizational development standpoint and from the business point of view, what, what kind of uh, issues does this raise for you? So um, I, I work in training and development, leadership development, succession planning, training, HR, and, and so with that as a backdrop, a couple things about Avista. We have three Department of Energy Smart Grid grants going on. One is the Workforce Training Grant that I've been involved with for a few years now. Uh, the other two grants are actually um, installing things um, in our customer base, which is causing us to have to accelerate all of the things around uh, how do we prepare our CSRs uh, for that. So I've been able to talk to our project managers and some of our uh, customer service managers before today so uh, later I can give you some examples of how this has already changed the CSR world and kind of what that's uh, meaning for the future. And then I think the, the second area that I can comment on is this whole um, third finding or fourth finding whatever it was on your slide about the bigger implications for the workforce and we're definitely seeing that at Avista. So what does this mean around um, what all of our jobs are going to have to change into and, and what does that mean for education? So I'll, I'll want to give you an example or two of that. And then the last thing that I'm reacting to off of Alan's, um, he calls it the spaghetti chart. And there's a lot of detail on that chart, but the, the gist of that is um, the, the customer service rep is a great on-ramp entry point for a lot of careers in our industry. And as Andrea already said, it's a really complex job. It's fast-paced. There's information. Uh, one small decision in an operations area has to translate immediately into how does that person answer the customer <coughs> question on the phone. And, and so I, I think it's a really important job in our industry. And I was just sitting here thinking about our CEO, Scott Morris. Um, he started with our company as a, a, a water heater wrapper, which is one of the demand side related jobs at energy efficiency jobs. And after that project got over, it was a few month project, he gravitated into the contact center, our call center. He was a CSR rep. And now he's the CEO, so, so that kind of gives um, some credence to this notion that it's a great entry point. And we have about 30 um, directors, which are our senior level managers in our company. And I was just counting, I, I thought of at least four sitting here who started in our call center. So um, you can go a lot of different ways. A lot of our call center reps have um, gone on to do apprenticeships and become, um, you know, IBEW skilled trades people, so uh, I think that's one thing that's hitting me about this career lattice thing this afternoon. Thanks, Diane. Yeah. So I want to dig into the, to the, to the depths of this a little bit. So we, we hear that smart grid is going to change the work of CSRs, and there's going to be different requirements and expectations. So I'm looking at both of you thinking, give me some examples. What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis for a CSR? What did it used to be? What is it now? How is it different? I'll speak to that. Um, as a CSR, well, as a previous CSR, you would take a phone call from a customer. A customer wanted to know why their bill was such and such an amount. It was higher than what they expected. The CSR had to have the knowledge of your previous read was this, your current read is this, 
That means you use this many kilowatt hours times this much money, and that's how you got to this amount of your bill. And I must say that with Tacoma Public Utilities, we service five different types of utilities, water, garbage, sewer, power, and storm drain. So when the customer looks at the bill, they look at the total package, but we have to basically break it down to power because that's their biggest concern. So when you look, when the customer used to call, all you had to know was how to do a little basic math. Now when the customer calls, because we also have a website where the customer can go to the website and view their usage, they can view what they're using right now, which will show them what they've used within the last 10 minutes. Wow. They can view what they've used within the last week, which will show them the most recent seven days or the past seven days. They can view what they've used in the last 30 days, which would give them a month's worth of usage. And when they're viewing that usage, they get to see when they view right now and they see the last 10 minutes, they see what they've used every minute and how much it has cost them. And at the bottom, they see the total for that 10 minute time period. When they view their usage for seven days or 30 days, they see how much they've used every day and how much it has cost them for every day and the total that they've used for that week or that month. So I always explain to the CSRs, that gives the customer the opportunity to if you don't like what you're being billed for, you have the opportunity to change it because you can go to the website, you can look at what you used last week, and you can say, I don't, you can double, you can, if you know you have a four week billing cycle, you can times that by four or eight week billing cycle, and you can say, I don't want to pay that much. So you have the opportunity to conserve, it teaches conservation. And so you have the opportunity to lessen that amount. So by the time you get to 30 days or a 60 day billing cycle, you could have cut your bill in half. When Tacoma Power was having rate increases, my bill was going down because I was utilizing the tools I had. And it's very difficult for the CSRs to grasp all that knowledge and to use those tools. So I think training is a really big issue when you get into smart meters, smart grid, but um, it's a very effective tool. What does that look like at PSC or at Vista? So I think at Puget, it's a very similar conversation. Customers will call in when the bill exceeds a threshold. We don't, customers just want the lights to be on. They don't particularly call the utility and say, thanks, today's the 10th, I got my bill in the mail just like I expected. <laughs> you know, that's not why they call. They call because the bill is too high or something is wrong. There is a trigger for every customer that says, I need to understand. So the thing about the conversation becomes, the CSR has to be equipped to educate the consumer who's on their cell phone, who may be driving home from work, who may be, you know, running between errands or soccer practice or whatever the case may be. Break that information down into bite-sized pieces very, very quickly because you don't really want to talk to the utility for 15 minutes. You only want to be on the phone about three minutes, maybe four if you can help it. And make them understand where the conservation change, or where the dollars change, where the, where the threshold is, where the break even point is for that consumer. And so as a CSR, they need to have the ability to quickly access that consumer's information, look at that power, make a very, very quick assessment and analysis, and then communicate to that customer, this is X, Y, and Z. The customer's not gonna remember 10 to multiple, 10 things. They're only gonna remember at the most three. So you're, they're not gonna remember, we need to multiply this times eight weeks, times four weeks, times, they don't care. They really wanna cut to what's my one, two, three, and then I'm off the phone and gone. And I think that as we, as I've watched this dynamic change in this industry, it's very interesting to see how consumers react to when they want that money, because they'll tell you, well, I only have five minutes or I'm, you know, I'm in traffic, or I'll call you back when they want the detailed information. And it's very interesting how that dynamic is changing now. Or they'll call on their break at work or their lunch break. And they will just simply say, well, I don't understand, I'll call you back. So there, there really is, becoming that need to be able to digest complex technical information and communicate that to a consumer in layman's terms that they can understand very, very quickly. And Alan, can I add one thing that I left out? It also, when, a, when the consumer on the other end on the website, you can also, well the CSR, not the consumer, because they don't have it broken down like our system breaks it down for the CSRs. 
But you can also see peak usage, and you can also see average usage, and you can, it's, it's, you know, it gets really complicated, but once you grasp it, it's the best tool you can have. But when you can talk to a customer and say, well, I see your peak usage is, is at like 2 o'clock in the morning. You have a spike in power at 2 o'clock in the morning because you're looking at what they've used for 24 hours that day because you can see their 24-hour history. Then you can better talk to the customer and help them to understand what's going on in their homes. And I think when I, we first started implementing this program, the customers had a concern about Big Brother watching. It's because you can talk to them about peak usage at different times of the day, and we had to do a lot of... Um, educating the customer and saying, no, we can't see what's going on in your house, but I can see that at 4.30 in the afternoon, you have a peak in power. You have a drop in power about 11, at 11 p.m., so you know people usually go to bed at night. So um, there's a drop in power then. You can see peaks in power at different times. And as you talk to the customer, what, I can, what, helps, what they help me figure out is what's going on in their house. I, I know when there's a peak in power at 2 o'clock in the morning, the lady said, well, my husband works nights, and he gets off at nights, he comes home, he turns everything on, and he sits down, he has a sandwich, blah, blah, blah. So that explains why you have a peak at 2 o'clock in the morning. So it, it, it better help. the customers can accept your explanation when it makes sense. And I think with the smart meters, it has allowed me to be able to help the customer understand that, yeah, you're using more when you're doing this, when your oven is on, when your dryer's on. I can see you're consuming more. You consume more on the weekends. So the CSRs will have to be able to, it's a lot of information at your fingertips that you have to be able to not so much figure out because the computers figure it out for you, but you have to be able to decipher it and explain it to the customer. A lot of what we hear about um, is how customers have access to all this great information at the same time, we ought to automate as much of it as possible because most customers don't want to have all that information to deal with. So what are you hearing from customers about that? I mean, how would you characterize it? Are people resistant? Do they even understand? Uh, to what extent are they taking advantage of this new information? And to what extent are they confused by it? What are you hearing? Well, initially they hate it. <laughs> they don't like the idea because they're resistant to change. But once the customers go on the website and they can see their consumption and stuff, when our website is down, I'm the first person to know via the customer. I get in at 8, I have a call at 8.15, the website's down. So they get more used to it, and of course the customers that are more technology savvy, I mean, because you can build graphs, you can do all kinds of stuff with, I mean, I guess everybody's program would be different, but they graph out their consumption, so they may be resistant at first, but once they can go online, they can see their consumption, they can manage it, they learn that they can manage their consumption, they, they start to accept it and like it. We have people calling up now saying, can I have one of those smart beaters? <laughs> well, it, one thing in, in, uh, that we're experiencing, which is a lot like how we all do airline uh, reservations now, and um, I like Alaska has the pre-flight alert that I can put to a text to my phone, what we're finding out is, is a lot of our customers really don't want to talk to us. They want to do simple transactions, make payment arrangements, pay their bill, do everything um, just through a, a, a quick interface. And even better, uh, we're really working on mobile apps for that. So we're seeing a lot of our um, interface with customers driving to, to that kind of modality. And, and what we're really thinking, the CSR role is going to evolve into more of an energy advisor. So when I, I have problems with my house or I want to reduce my consumption or I don't understand what um, I'm seeing on the web portal, um, that's where they're going to want to engage with a human being rather than you know just get on the web and pay my bill. And, and so that ability um, in, our, in our one smart grid project in Pullman, we have five minute interval data. So the ability, the, the CSR is going to be able to see everything that the customer is seeing um, on their web interface. So the ability to look at that, pick out the relevant data, um, make a hypothesis about what might be going on, ask some really great and quick questions to get to the root of, you know, it is my husband at 2 a.m. Or, or whatever, and then offer two or three solutions. And, and by the way, we measure our call center by, uh, you know, handle time, time on the phone, and, you know, are we effectively and quickly 
uh, helping customers, that's going to be a real challenge. And, and just, I, I have one other example which I think really highlights how this role is going to be changing because the theme I heard is it's, it's, it was hard enough to begin with and it's going to become a lot more technical. So in our Pullman project, we have um, all the homes down there now have smart meters, but we're doing a demonstration where a thousand customers are going to be getting uh, EcoB thermostats in their homes that will give them a digital interface about you know minute to minute usage uh, within their homes right on their walls. And and by the way, as as part of that experiment, uh, when you sign up, you have to agree that a, a Vista can. Um, change the temperature of your home plus or minus two degrees so that we can learn more about managing loads and, and uh, peak demand, et cetera. So, so we're about to implement that and we're trying to get customers to sign up. So meanwhile, back at the call center, we're thinking about, okay, so it's 2 a.m. and the customer can't figure out what's going on on this little thing on their wall. Um, their internet service their their routers down so they can't get on the web portal to see all this cool um, stuff to figure out what they're um, and meanwhile their furnace is cycling on and off and it's the middle of the night and they don't know why or um, the screen's blank on their thermostat or whatever so thinking about okay who are they going to call well gee they should call ecobee because that's the manufacturer there's this little thing on the yeah. wall well they should call the the uh, hvac dealer that can help them figure out what's going on with the phone well they should call um ecobee has a web portal well avista has a web portal well avista had set up this whole program in the beginning so do i you know who do i call so right now um in fact it was about a week or two ago uh, what we call our 24-hour reps and our home agents, so people that could answer the phone at 2 a.m. or 8 in the morning or, or whenever, have started to go through some training around troubleshooting this new device in the home. So that's a whole new competency that these call center reps didn't have to do. Um, walking people through, you know, when you think about if you have Comcast or whatever and your internet goes down, you get on the phone and they say, you know, is your router light blinking red or is it green? And unplug it and push this and push that and then disconnect it from the computer and, and reconnect it. Or trying to diagnose, do I need to dispatch um, so-and-so HVAC contractor because it's actually something going on uh, with their furnace. So when you think about just that little scenario and what it's going to take to equip this group of our employees, many of whom have less than five years of service now. So uh, because of what Andrea was talking about, you know, these are people that haven't had 20 years to sit and figure all this stuff out. It's like, what a challenge that is. And this is just for a small number of our customers so that we can experiment with what does this mean for the whole industry. So to me, that just boggles my mind around the training implications and uh, the degree of difficulty in this job and the degree of technical and people skills and math skills and all of that that you're going to have to have to stay in these jobs. Diane, you mentioned that it was hard enough to begin with, and now right. we're expecting so much more. Right. And granted, if this is far along in some of these demonstration projects, you can really get into some of these thorny issues. But in other organizations where automatic metering is being deployed, and I'm thinking from the perspective of somebody who has to represent employees uh, yeah. in a utility, what, what are you hearing about that? Is it, is it overload? Is it what, What's really going on from the CSR's point of view? Is this, is this managing it? Well, technology is scary. <laughs> you know, it's scary for the CSR or anybody that works in the utility world that, to know that technology could possibly take their job, right? So, I'm, Andrea and I have had this conversation multiple times in the past, and it's really good to hear that Diane has the same not or the same opinion that technology is not the beast. It it's just the way that we as CSRs are going to change and have to have a different skill set and have to know different things down the road. 
So technology is not going to get rid of CSRs. It's just going to, we have to know how to mobilize on how to think differently. And our CSRs are going to be different in having energy advisors, knowing how to break it down for our, our customers in different ways. So it's not just the call up and say, hey, I need to make a payment arrangement. It's going to be more of, why is yours peak at 2 o'clock in the morning? Or, you know, break it down as far as that. So when I hear the, you know, big rumor of outsourcing because of technology coming into play, it's easier for me to say, because I have been around hearing about the smart grid, that no, it's not going to be outsourcing. It's going to be, you're going to be thinking differently. So you have different skill sets that you need to know. But that's where training comes in so that people aren't scared. But technology is scary from the beginning. So Responses to that? I, th I think that as I look at the utility industry specifically compared to other industries where the technology is so far advanced <clears throat> already, and, and I think about the airline industry where, you know, those of you Washington State natives can interact with Alaska Air and can interact with Gen. I don't know if any of you go yeah. on their website or whatever. You know, you can speak that you really don't need a person. The utility industry doesn't quite have that level of sophistication yet, and it will be very interesting. And, I'll, and one of the reasons they don't is because the technology is so complex. There's so much data. So to make a voice, um, an interactive system, a mobile app or anything like that, do what an airline industry does, I'll give you an example. To move an airline to book a reservation, because it only has to understand about 7,500 phrases. I mean, the city of, of Seattle is SEA. It's Seattle. It's Seattle. It's Seattle. It doesn't change. So in, in the airline industry, about 50,000 words will give you enough information to book your reservation, change your city, dates, everything else. You're done. 50,000 words will only get you halfway moved in into a, into a residence in the utility industry. <laughs> only halfway. Only halfway. So if you want it, so if you think about that from an automated system and sort of the icons and things that we are so accustomed to seeing in the Google, Yahoo, Facebook world, you know, in 50,000 words, if I call up and say, move in, one, two, three, Main Street, and I still am not in when I hang up. You know, you're looking at suddenly what is it going to take? And so what happens is customers get frustrated with that technology and they wind up calling. So the call center rep or the customer service representative now becomes more of what I see in the vision as a help desk agent. They have to know how to troubleshoot the technology, they have to explain the technology, understand where you were in the technology, and then provide a level of service with a smile that gets you back on track. And that really is where I think the evolution is going to come. They really are going to be a blended agent where they are sharing information and solving problems. And I think if you look at that from what is that skill set, how do you prepare this, this person to become a, a worker, it, it changes the traditional customer service profile. It's no longer, oh, and, and I, I used to get, I, I still get this a lot. Well, I have a daughter, or I have a niece, or a nephew. Very rarely do I get, I have a son, <laughs> unless you think it. Every now and then, you will, but it's very interesting that the sons get into the call center with the expectation that they're going to move into one of the mm -hmm. apprenticeship programs. But in, in interesting, in the utility industry, it's very interesting that that is that dynamic. But now, I think that it's going to change where it's going to become more of a professional position. Yeah. And I think that this kind of research and skill-based standardization where this is the minimum requirement suddenly makes it a very, it makes it a professional position and it changes the profile, which I think is exciting because for a long time, you know, they customer service reps have particularly been the entry-level portal so they don't get as much attention. In the utility industry, I think this kind of standardization will change that model and then it becomes a viable career path in itself mm -hmm. for males, females, which is traditionally a non you know, they're more predominantly female in uh, workplaces, but suddenly it becomes a very viable path for a career standpoint versus a past role. Because the, the skill base you're going to have is very different. You hardly ever hear Microsoft help desk people leave it, or Dale's help desk people leave it. Where do they go? They stay in the help desk because their level, first, they're considered professionals, they're considered IT professionals, and secondly, their level of job satisfaction is much higher because they have a level of respect in the industry that's missing in your traditional call center. I think that is going to change as technology forces the utility industry to change. And I also think as those things changes and as the role for the CSR changes, so does the financial part of it. So mm -hmm. that may be a little incentive for people to 
be more attractive to CSR positions. The CSRs that we've had at the utility that have been there for years, and Andrea and I were talking about this, how resistant they are to change. Those, that's, that's, I think that's the harder part of it, is how do you take a CSR that has been with your company for 12, 15 years doing the same job and doing it well, and then you add this other technology level onto them, which they're not even interested, remotely interested in technology, and you have all of the younger people that are coming in and out of college and internships, and they're eager and hungry for it. So it's a balancing act, and I would hate to be in Rachel's position because the classifications and things will have to change. I understand now with Tacoma Public Utilities to work on the front line where you're taking customers in per payments from customers in person, you have to pass a math test. Mm -hmm. So there were, there were people that have been up there for years, and I'm like, first, when? She didn't pass the test. So there's all of these new faces up there. So things will change, but so will your financial situation. You will be rewarded for that extra layer of technology. I, I think that's the good part about it. So our utilities, were utilities ready for this? I, I want to entertain questions a little bit later, but do uh, you think utilities are ready for this change? Have they been ready for this change? What can utilities best do to support CSRs evolve into this new role? Training, pre-training. I heard one of the speakers earlier that said that we implement these things and we, we don't look at the end user or the CSR until after it's over and done with. Training beforehand, exposure to things like conservation, green power, exposure to, you know, even energy-wise appliances. My role, when I, when I came from a CSR, I also worked on the project for the city of Tacoma implementing SAP, a citywide computer system. And then I worked in the conservation office. So I think with all of, and I worked in the dispatch, the 24 hour dispatch. So I think all of the skills I acquired made me a well-rounded candidate and they came to find me to ask me to take the position of working with the engineers on the automatic meter reading and AMI project. So will all CSRs have the ability to go to those different places and grab that experience? No, but training ahead of time will prepare them for, to utilize these very expensive tools that we now have. And it will make it less scary for the CSR exactly. to be able to do their job yeah. efficiently and so that they aren't so scared to make that change right. into their new skill set, set right. that they have to know in order to help the customer yeah. and to succeed in the utility. I probably have a different opinion on that. Sure. I, I think that um, it is, I don't think the utilities are ready for the pace of change that they're going to need to have to incur, particularly in the Northwest region. Um, this region is chock full of high tech, services and you know consumers expect the utilities to be like Amazon, mm -hmm. Microsoft, Google, Expedia. They they want to know why don't you have a mobile app? Where's my iPad app? And they don't want it tomorrow, they want it yesterday. So I think the level of the rapid cycle change that's going to have to occur and the utilities are gonna have to catch up with it because it's been a you know a bolts and wires industry for a lot of years. I don't think they're ready for, and I think it is going to be a very difficult transition. But for the utilities to be viable long term, they must make the transition, particularly from an employee standpoint. The employees have to make the transition. Now, that is very, very difficult. And some of it is generational because there is, there's technology, I'm thinking, Lord, oh, there's something else. <laughs> there's another, you know, I mean, just because of my age, right? I'm just like, I'm good. I got the iPhone, I can do this, I can do the two or three things, I can book online, I'm good. I don't need to do anything else. There comes a point where I'm like, I don't need to know that. So, but then you get the next generation behind me and they want, this is all you got? You know, where's the rest? And when am I gonna get it? Or they come in and look at the system and they're like, what is this? So suddenly, you know, in utilities, in order to be viable and to be a viable employer, have to have systems and technology that attract the best talent, 
the, the top rated talent because people want to work where there's cutting edge technology. Microsoft is in their backyard, in our backyard. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're competing with Microsoft, <laughs> you know, you really have to be able to say, yeah, but we've got this cutting edge technology and we're on this, whether it's smart grid or whatever these systems are, or the smart house kind of thing. That's fascinating to a college kid or a graduate. And you know, they can run over to Microsoft and get a smart house, smart car, smart this, smart that, and they're like, all you got is half a house. <laughs> you know? So I think, I do think it is a, going to be a tough transition for the utility for this industry because of, it's been, it's been a bolts and wires industry for, yeah. A lot of years. So it is going to be a rapid cycle change, though. So, Diane, the Vista must have had a few lumps and bumps along the way in this demonstration project. What, what are you hearing about? I mean, what, what, was a Vista ready for this? Did you understand what you're getting yourself into? Well, I, I think because there have been some other smart grid and also automated meter installations around the country, one of the things we really focused on is what, what went wrong in Boulder and other places and really tried to focus on doing this right in Pullman and so knock on wood we've had a pretty good acceptance rate um, in terms of that implementation and some of the things that we had is um, when we first put in uh, the meters we trained a, uh, a whole queue of like 30 40 CSRs to get ready for all the calls and there weren't any calls and so just things like trying to match when, when are the questions going to come because you can get complacent and say well we don't really need to do that training and then as soon as consumers get really savvy you know we're going to get slammed with that so so how do you train people in the right timing um, is one of our challenges and then this whole energy advisor thing um, we're really trying to get our our hands around what does that look like and just um, Two weeks ago, uh, we used SurveyMonkey in the contact center. There was a SurveyMonkey that went out, that, uh, and the gist of it, I haven't got the results yet, but what is it going to take for you to feel confident as an energy advisor? Just starting to get some um, dialogue going through electronic means because our people are on the phones constantly, so it's really hard to have um, you know a big meeting and sit and talk for hours around it. So, so what can we do to really understand the needs of our people? so that we can equip them. And, and also, it, it takes a long time to recruit and assess the right people for these jobs. They go through at least five weeks of training. They go through a period of time where uh, they're mentored and um, before they're really fully on the phones. And then you layer in all these new technologies and new competencies. It's also about how do you retain that investment. And to Andrea's point, you know, you can walk across the street with all that knowledge and go to a much cooler, easier environment to deal with, why wouldn't you? So I, I think that's going to be a challenge of retention. And we've got a very um, low tenured uh, call center workforce now, and that's completely different than what we had when I started. Um, and, and so what is that going to mean for the future as well? Other reactions to that? Uh, I think Common Power has the same concerns and our workforce is aging, and just before I left, there was like maybe six retirement notices in the elevator, so we are definitely, um, I guess, we're looking at how do we get good people, how do we retain good people. Um, we don't know yet. It's, it's all new. We're just kind of stumbling through this. Like I said, I'm the only body, and they need about 10 of me. They don't know it, but <laughs> I, know it. I think it's a two-pronged worry, at least in the um, at, at Puget for at Puget Sound Energy for us. We have the we have a tenured, tenured workforce. I'm really proud of that on the one hand, but I can see where the technology is going to cause some of my workforce real problems. And some of them have said, "This is going to be the last one. I'm retiring before you, you get there." Right? There's a few that have said, eh, "We'll see. We'll ride it out." But then I have this other group that has come in in that five year, five to six year, they're hungry, they're ready to move, they know the technology, it's not a hindrance for them, they just leap those hurdles and say, you know, what next? And so they have a desire to move at a faster pace than I can offer them and keep them motivated, intrigued, and they're ready to go on to the next, you know, the next greatest thing. And, you know, Google is down the street, and I don't know, I'm, I don't know how many of you know in the, you know, in the retail world, 
Zappos is right now like the best call center in the world ever rate. Right? So you go there and it's like a playground. I can never work there. I cannot work in that environment. It's just unstructured. Like people are hanging out and they're hanging from the ceilings and the rafters. I'm like, okay. But Google is very close to our call center. Google is like that. I mean, they've got a basketball arena in there, they've got a cafeteria. I mean, you know, so suddenly, you know, you had, you're competing with the likes of that for this same employee with that technical ability, the ability to provide service, and break that down into small chunks. So it was really a, that's so I have a two problem right there. And as a union, we strive to provide good members in any craft that we that we provide for the utility. And being a CSR and knowing the turnaround and kind of the revolving door in the call center, especially because I represent members at PSE, it is a revolving door. But I think once we start moving towards that it is more of a craft career world, we will stop seeing that revolving door. So it's important for us as a union to be on the same track of what's next, what's next, what's next, and be open-minded instead of just having this, you know, nuts and bolts union and, and keep it going that way. So if it's true that we have an occupation that's changing rapidly because technology is forcing that change, and if it's true that we're expecting more of this workforce than we ever have before, indeed to the point where it's becoming more technical, more professional in some respects, and more craft oriented, what does that mean in terms of education and training? What would we, what would we tell our colleges, our apprenticeship programs, our other support systems, how to prepare for this change? How do we provide a pipeline of support for this industry, for this occupation moving forward? What are your thoughts on that? Anyone? Anyway. Um, I came out of education as a kindergarten teacher, and so I remember thinking at one year that if I was de designing a, a curriculum and instruction path, or if I was in that arena and de designing a curriculum that would make this profile of employees successful, it would include, first and foremost, the communication skills. Um, and I think about the communication skills because you really do have to know how to quickly assess um, the speakers or the callers' communication styles and adjust to that very, very quickly. You have to diffuse that. So I think those that, that component is number one because again, our the utility strength is in what we know about the power and the ability to share it. So the ability to to um, decipher the complex and break it down quickly is one thing. So I think communication skills was one of the things that I would put into a curriculum program. The other thing would be the computational skills. You're going to have to have the quantitative skills and some analysis skills to be able to say what's needed. And then probably the next path that I would do that is some technical aptitude. So you may not need to be a programmer, but certainly you're going to have to be more than your first level class, right? And so that ability to understand what that technology is, and maybe master it with, um, partner it with some actual technical um, types of training. Like I, coming into the utility industry, I just didn't know it, so I went to meter school. And so it really brought that whole thing together for me. So, you know, I don't envision myself going out and pulling a meter, but I certainly understand how it works and enough to understand how that relates to moving power. And so those are the kinds of things where I think it'll be a little bit of a mastery of the, uh, a little bit of technical with the rest of the components, um, with what I call soft skills. So that would be my career. Yeah, so what I'd add to that is just, just that ability to, to look at data spot trends, um, problem solve, and come up with solutions quickly. And, and along with that, there's an underlying kind of a math ability um, that, I, that I see. And just in general, um, a couple other things that, that we are focused on is, is really finding people that um, have the kind of dedication to our customers and the, the work ethic and, and kind of buy into, you know, we're here to serve our customers day in and day out. That's that's really important to have that perspective and that passion for our work and, and however you build that in. I, I think the other thing is is really that more cross-disciplinary because as you can tell, um, you need to know a lot about a lot of different things. So bringing together the right, I like to call them reusable learning objects to create the right training that, that fits the situation uh, rather than it, it's one thing or another, it, it needs to be um, multidisciplinary. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, just with the demographics of the workforce that you heard from Wanda uh, this morning and the number of 
jobs that are going to be open and, and the, the demographics of our uh, the star society. Another thing we're really focused on is, is attracting a diverse work pool um, to our company. But these these are great jobs, a lifelong career, whether you stay in this job or you branch out, and, and really wanting to make sure that people understand uh, and get the right training so that they can enter into the energy field and, and have a lifelong career. And I, I think one thing that I would add to what Diane and Andrea said is one of the other reasons that um, I think that I was selected to work with this group was I didn't think of myself as a technology savvy person. I, I was comfortable with the computer, but I know a ton more now than I ever wanted to know. One of the things <laughs> the engineers said about me was that I was a quick learner and I caught on quick. So I think somebody who can comprehend or understand or however you would put that in your skill set, someone who can catch on and, and pick up things really quick because I use about five different programs on a daily basis or more. And I have to agree with all three ladies and uh, especially the technology or the technical background. Being a CSR answering the calls, just answering the questions, but you need to know where the power comes from. It's not just flipping the switch. Where where does that come from? So you need to have an understanding of what where that where you are providing the benefit to the customer. And so the technical piece is definitely a portion that is necessary. That's good input. In a moment, I want to give each panelist a chance to give some kind of final culminating thoughts on this issue. But I think this would be a great time to open up for questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I just want to say I'm encouraged to hear uh, the comments by everybody. I mean, I know technology is driving a lot of changes and to see things moved away from metrics driven stopwatch sort of uh, workplace that I, I think of as call centers that I've heard about is a good encouraging to hear. I mean, the workers do need to be rewarded with a more relaxed place, workplace if they're going to invest a lot of time and energy learning new technologies. Observation. Patrick. Uh, Patrick Neville, I'm from the King County Labor Council. And <clears throat> I guess this is a little more of a tangential comment more than a question. Uh, so I'm also a union member of uh, Office and Professional Employees International Union. And um, uh, my union represents a lot of uh, uh, call center workers in the healthcare industry. And you know, looking through this and having uh, the experience of, of this panel, it seems to me that these issues are the same. And, and I'm thinking of healthcare. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to applaud this effort uh, because I can see this turning into sort of a process model for other industries that, that I don't know if there has been research done for uh, CSRs in other industries or not, but I can see this uh, being used uh, across other industries that are facing the same issues. Um, so I, I just wanted to applaud this effort. Thanks, thanks very much for that. Rob. I wonder, uh, Rob Crow with the Spokane Area Workforce Development Council, I wonder with, with some of these uh, transitions, uh, what, what had been a fairly easy entry level position and, and a gateway to, uh, to, to bring in somebody that, that had maybe just the, the, the kernel of aptitude and progress them in their career um, and or somebody that spent 20 years in the, in the department. With this shift and now you're talking about somebody that has to come with a lot more uh, at, at the start and at the onset, um, a lot more beyond. Are you now? Now, where where will your entry? Where will that avenue be if if, uh, if that's eliminated, or or will there always still be a blend? I mean, some some that are technical and, and capable of the the um, higher level of, of uh, um, advice and, and interaction, and then some who who might start out at, at a, at a uh, more basic level and move their way up. Well, at Tacoma Power, we have layers of CSRs. So we have a front office CSR that answers phone calls and from the customers, and we have back office CSRs that are considered technical. 
So there's a division. So the entry level CSR now, even with having the division, what I see now, and I've been out of that role for quite some time now, but what I see now is more CSRs are higher with at least associate's degrees. So I think it's going toward yeah, that's, I yeah, know that's it's same and, yeah. yeah, I think that there is going to come a point where we're going to be, have to say you do not have the skill set to do this job. Mm -hmm. I do think that that's a tough message to hear because people like to put that sort of um, what I would call the, the, the entry level performer that has a limited capacity in the call center. That's sort of been the default role. I am saying that that message needs to change mm -hmm. and that the call center employee in the utility industry, and I think healthcare is another one where it falls into that same component, is going to have to have a level of skill that has not traditionally been associated with call centers because the easy stuff is automated. That's why airlines don't have 10 call centers anymore. That's why phone companies don't need them. It's automated. The easy stuff in the utility is automated. The stuff that's left is hard. <laughs> so, so what's happening is there may be some opportunity, but that opportunity for that person is going to be smaller and smaller. And I, I like to say to my staff uh, in the call center, I'm in the call center by choice. I love the industry. I love the field. And I'm not ashamed by telling people, look, I'm in the call center because I'm smart, because I like it. You know, I want to be there. I said, but one of the things that you have to have is you have to have a skill set that says, yeah, I'm good at it too. And it's not just because it's the only job I can find. And there was a period in the United States where you only worked in the call center if it was the only job you could find. And that's when they all got shipped overseas. Well, that is no longer the case because suddenly over there they're like, oh, this isn't working out so good. So they're all coming back. So now all of the big five, the Fortune 500s want the best call center reps. They're looking at should they be associate degrees, should they be you know, undergrad degrees. And what is that breaking point where you have an entry level pool that is limited and then the next level. So I, I, I would like the human side of me would like to believe there will always be room for that. I think there is going to come a point where there's going to be a smaller and smaller portion of that. Probably industry-wide. Yeah. That's right. And Jeff, I, you I had think a question? What, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, what Delphine said about that ability to learn, so even without a degree, if you can show that yeah. you have you know, kind of the right aptitude and that ability to learn, I, I think you can thrive in that. Environment, but you definitely have to have that propensity um, and, and that kind of drive to learn and consume information and new information every day um, and volumes of information and, and want to do that every day and, and just be the giant sponge. I think you can be very successful um, if you're that Jeff, you mindset. I do. Uh, First, a, a comment. I think this has been a fascinating session, and I've learned a lot. I, I'm thinking back way back in the 1980s. I was a vice president of Southern California Edison for energy efficiency, and part of the, my team was the call center. And I'm just thinking about the kinds of questions that they had then, the kinds of questions you guys are getting now, from 1982 to now, it's just a totally different world. Uh, the question I have. Um, would, would involve ratcheting up the, the level of expertise and complexity many, many fold. One of the debates within the utility community has been whether we should move to real-time pricing. And if we do move to real-time pricing, that would basically be giving the customers the signal that their, their power rates would, would differ throughout the day based on how much it's really costing the utility to buy them that power during peak periods versus during during the balance. And uh, you know a lot of people, a lot of advocates are saying smart grid advocates are saying you really can't get all the benefits of the smart grid if you don't have that because right now you're not providing customers for real life signals for the cost of the utility. On the other hand, a lot of complexity involved in that and suddenly customers are you're wanting me to do what? I can't turn on my TV now because of what? You know? And all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you have any thoughts about that <coughs> from the perspective of customer service reps at, as the utilities begin to seriously mull out those, mull, consider developing those sorts of programs. I probably have lots of thoughts on it because I have lots of thoughts on lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's, it's, it, in, in the Nintendo model, we're at level three, and instead of directing it right. to 12. I think, that's a, I think there's a couple things. One is it, it's a very hard concept for consumers to get, right? So that, that immediately throws a pall on, are they going to use it? Are they going to have adoption? Because you can build in that kind of complexity into your infrastructure at millions of dollars. It's got to be able to go back through the rate payer. That's the other thing. The consumers really want to pay for the fact that, mm, wait a minute, I'm going to save $20, which is what happened in Boulder. And I'm a, I live in Colorado. I commute between here and Colorado and in Denver. And in Boulder, suddenly the businesses said, this is only saving me $50 a month. It's not worth the hassle. And they quit using it, which has really started to be the change. It took about five years. But you know, if you're going to invest, if it takes us, we're putting in an $80 million system. If it takes us another $80 million to do time of use or time of day rates, and we're only going to get 20% on that return, it's not going to happen. So I think there is... And the differential in the Northwest is pretty small. It is. It's tiny. So then it becomes, is it really worth it? We're not sitting in California or back in the Northeast where we've got, you know, huge coal power, you know, um, differences. So I, I'm not sure that it's going to happen soon. I'm not sure it's going to happen in my career. But I certainly think that there may come a time for that, but it will be driven by consumer demand. I don't think that the industry is going to want to invest the dollars to drive it. I could be horrible about that, but that's what I think. I think if I'm sitting in, a, in the executive suite and I have to make that call, I'm going to wait till I see the consumers really want it before I probably park them ahead. I don't know that I would make that call. And I think Tacoma Power wrestled with that when we implemented SAP because SAP gives you that ability to right. manage that. And our management decided no. And it may not be feasible if you produce the majority of your own power. Yeah. So if you're buying on the open trade, all of that comes into play, right? So I, I just don't know. That's too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I have maybe one comment that's more of the concluding part of this. I, I, we're awash in a sea of data points um, at all levels all departments and, and so you add pricing data to the millions of data points we're getting from all of this technology and it's already hard enough to figure out in every department what do I pay attention to what is something that's telling me I need to maintain my system differently or invest in different assets or do something different on the customer side and then you know, it's like great we'll add a few million more data points and, and we're already struggling with, with everybody in their job is going to have to become some more of a data analyzer and a curator of data and really figuring out what's relevant, what isn't, what is noise, um, what's going to cause um, you know, a safety issue or what do I pay attention to. So I, I think we have enough on our hands right now just trying to manage the data we have, let alone adding another um, you know, it's this price at midnight and this price at 12.05 and, <laughs> and trying to figure all that out. And that's just my little pea brain saying, I don't want to, I don't want to even <laughs> I'll be retired when that happens. <laughs> yeah. I'm done. So you answered, you guys gave me the answer I thought I was going to get. <laughs> well, that's a great segue, Diane, into our final concluding thoughts. I've asked these panelists to think about what are their final observations, recommendations about how we can help support this industry, but also this occupation as it moves forward? Delphine, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are smart grid, smart metering. There are definitely advantages, a lot of advantages. But on the other side, there's also the disadvantages. When we first started, our field crews thought that they would go away because of remote metering and remote disconnects and reconnects. That's not so much true because you can cycle those people into other different areas. It takes a lot of support to support smart meters and smart, we don't have the grid yet, but I'm, right now we have a whole group of 45 employees that are working on smart grid. Um, so I would say that going into the future, I think we're going in the right direction. I think the skill standards that Alan has come up with hit the nail on the head as far as the CSR. I think in order to be prepared for the future, um, people need to talk more about, or more to your staff about, or employees or people coming out of school about conservation and green power. I remember a couple years ago, solar was the big thing. So I, I don't think conservation is going to be a phase. 
Um, I think the more knowledge you have coming into the field, the better off you will be. And I also um, would like to add someone that's been in the field that doesn't have a degree and has made it through to where I am today. My salary right now is such, because I work with these engineers, is such that if I had to go to school, I could not go to school and get a four-year degree and come out of school making the money that I make now. So there's, a, there's advantages to it because I have a way of living that I can really enjoy. And so I, I just think it, it's a good thing, but you definitely need to um, prepare if, if, if the industry is, and I think all of the industry is switching over to smart grids, then the educators and the employers and employees need to keep in mind that um, if the more education and more knowledge, the more exposure to those things that people have, the better the better they're going to look to employers. Diane, do you have any other, other final thoughts on this? Well, I, I just um, I think it's a really cool industry. And that these are broader thoughts and the idea that you know now we can't even flush a toilet without um, electricity <laughs> and get into a hotel room and it, it really is um, a meaningful business and a, and a career and it's very complex it always has been it's getting more and more complex and, and the need for all kinds of jobs I think we're going to have more jobs not less I think they'll be moving to more of um, some of what we've already talked about more professional level more technical more data analysis um, and making sense of you know how do we provide really great solutions to our customers all of those things make it I think um, and I've been in this industry um, three and a half years I, I think it's one of the most exciting times um, at, at every level, if you, you know, you're an apprentice coming into a craft, if you're coming into a call center, if you're coming into engineering or whatever role um, you're doing, I, I just um, really am glad that we have this partnership of everyone trying to help us figure out how to prepare the workforce. So whatever your role is in the room, I just want to thank you all for your efforts and your interest in our industry because it, it's really important. I think. Rachel. And again, being a union representative, um, we are excited to see what technology brings to the workforce. We are excited to see how it changes our workforce and how we can prevent, better provide the workforce to the utilities. So um, me particularly, I'm excited to see how the CSRs change and see the technology change. Um, and, but um, just as in general as a union, we are excited and we have to, I have to keep the, as they call themselves, this is what they call themselves, the, the gray hair beard guys of the union, um, I have to keep them open minded and I think that's one of the reasons why I, I am a business representative and a utility local that is uh, a younger member, so just keeping it, keeping it real and, and uh, light is what I'm here for. Thanks, and Andrea, the final word. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I think that this is fascinating. I think I, I, I am so uh, glad to see the work that Alan's team has done in this sort of research. And I remember, um, I think when I arrived in Washington, it was about the time we were doing the journeyman apprenticeship book. And I remember thinking, gosh, when is somebody going to do this for a call center? <laughs> and so when I got the call that they were doing this, I was jumping for joy because I thought, wow. What a chance to really make a difference and change um, what call centers look like for the future. And to me, you know, after being here, being in this industry for 20 years, it's fascinating because when I started in the call center, we were just the girls that answered the telephone. We weren't even called call center. We just answered the phone. So it was really pretty exciting to be on the front edge of this. And I think in this industry, particularly in utilities, it's a fascinating industry. It is really fascinating. And I changed careers to join, or changed industries to come into the, call, to the uh, utility industry because I thought, oh, this is going to be amazing in the next 10 years, primarily because of the new administration in Washington. And so um, I got interested in that because their convention was in Colorado and I volunteered. I don't know why I did that. But that was interesting. And so it really, um, 
opened up a whole new world of learning for me. And I think one of the things about this industry that has been, um, if, I, if there's some parting words, I guess, is it's a fascinating career. It is a long-term career. These can be lifetime careers for people in lots of areas. It gives people opportunities to learn in areas that you would never imagine. But I think one of the things that I was thinking about from the workforce development, it's been traditionally an industry that has been very limited in diversity. And so as I look around, the opportunity to go into some non-traditional employee base and, and get employees and, and bases and educate people on what kind of jobs are in this industry is a whole, has been an untapped mind in my opinion. I think there's very few um, inner city schools. Um, I think about the Latino community, I think about the African American community, I think about the Asian American community that you would go into and they say, what careers in the utility industry? They don't know what you're talking about because they don't see people find pools much anymore. And I think that there's an opportunity from an education standpoint to really open up an entire new world of workers and employees for the utility industry. Well, I think our audience would agree we've learned a lot about this industry, this occupation, and the uh, challenges and opportunities ahead in the new smart grid environment. So please join me in thanking our panel. sort of following this at a distance and I, I followed this whole process and I wasn't able to participate or, or sit in any of these sessions. So thank you.